Good right. morning, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Has anyone listened to any television newspaper or other account on this trial or case conducted? Please make sure that the cell phones are off and away. I don't want to see them. Good morning, Dr. Hood. Good morning. I'll have you go up to the other stand. Doctor, can I get you sworn in? State your name. My last name is Hood. H O O D. My first name is Ian, I A N. I'm a forensic pathologist and a medical examiner of Belgium. Thank you, Dr. Hood. The suction is saying you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good uh, morning, Dr. Hood. Good morning. Uh, you're a state of current professional at the medical department, right? Oh, yeah. And for Burlington County? Sure. Now, in order to become chief of medical, medical center, did you attend college and medical school? I did. I went to the medical school in my home land of New Zealand. Uh, uh, 
chemistry and of course and talk pathology, which is the study of uh, tissues uh, under a microscope. Anytime you get any kind of tissue removed, whether it's at surgery or just something done in a clinical office, it's looked at down a microscope uh, by a pathologist. And autopsy pathology is included in that, although autopsies are being done less and less in hospital settings, so they still are done to teach in hospitals, but that's about it. After your residency program, you continued on with your medical training? I did. As I say, I did my fellowship training in forensic pathology in the county of Wayne in Michigan. It was a very busy medical examiner's office in Detroit. I don't think we did at least 800 homicides a year there, and uh, close to 10,000 cases a year were referred. It was a, a, a busy, great place to learn forensic pathology. Now, are forensic pathology and surgical pathology different? They are. Surgical pathology is the branch that you're most familiar with, which is where you get uh, an organ or something removed at surgery, and that gets looked at by a surgical pathologist. And it's, the diagnosis is made, and therapy is based on what the pathologist sees uh, on the microscope. And it's sometimes even done on the fly in the uh, operating room, particularly with things like breast cancer. The, uh, Pathologists will do a frozen session right there and determine whether the disease is spreading the lymph nodes or not. And then the therapy right then and there is based on what the, uh, uh, the finding is. That's surgical pathology. Uh, autopsy pathology deals obviously with uh, opening the dead body after death to determine all the disease processes and injuries that may be present in the person. Uh, after completing your fellowship programs in surgical and forensic technology, did you receive any faculty appointments? Right after I graduated, I was taken on staff at Detroit, so I was an assistant medical examiner there for three years. And while there, I was on the adjunct staff for Wayne uh, at New York for the uh, University of Wayne uh, in Detroit. And then I, uh, so it just Wayne State. And when I came to Philadelphia, which I did three years after that, I was there for nearly 20 years as the acting or well, as the deputy and acting chief. Uh, I was on staff at all the major teaching institutions uh, in Philadelphia. We were at 1.6 medical school, but now down to four. Uh, and I was on staff, I still am, as an adjunct full professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And in theory, I am uh, still on staff of what is now Drexel University, but I started out when it was uh, about three names ago, we were actually originally CP9. Uh, but I have not uh, given the didactic lecture there for the time that I've been here. In theory, they can rotate the fellows through my office. They did that once, uh, but that medical school lost the attention hospital and got sold out from under them, so they are still struggling. Now, are you a member of any specialty boards? I have my pathology here in the U.S. and also in forensic pathology. And in Canada, as I say, I have my boards in anatomy and general. What's required uh, to become a member of those boards? You have to do a certain amount of required training at approved institutions where there's enough caseload and enough quality teaching staff and research facilities for you to be able to become properly familiar with uh, your specialty. And then of course, the big thing is at the end of it, you have three days worth of examinations. Uh, and that's the same in Canada as it is here. Uh, are you currently licensed to practice medicine? I am. Where? I'm licensed in all the states. I either worked in or trained in, with a couple of exceptions. In chronological, that would be New York, uh, Michigan, California, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and I once worked a job in Texas. So I continue the process, so I have a license in Texas. Dr. we mentioned earlier that you're the Chief Medical Examiner in Burlington County. Uh, how long have you held that position? Since July of 2018. And what are just some of your job duties as the Chief Medical Examiner? The Medical Examiner works under a statute that says what cases you must take jurisdiction on, and they're basically any case uh, someone who has died uh, of obviously non-natural causes, so homicide, accidents, suicides, drug deaths, uh, come under our jurisdiction. In any case, we don't know why the person died, they're just a found body, and 
those that they come under our jurisdiction. And some of those can be basically portions of bodies or skeletons. Uh, they still fall under our jurisdiction. And there's a couple of other uh, oddball ones, any ones that uh, any trial under three years would cause a death is not expected. Uh, any death related to pregnancy, any death in custody uh, falls under our jurisdiction as well. And even natural deaths, which make up the fault in our cases, uh, where you just can't find family members uh, to take charge of the body, or you can't find a doctor who knew the person was signing this for you. And that's about half of our cases. Approximately how many autopsies have you performed as the chief medical examiner? Here in Burlington, I've probably uh, performed two or three thousand uh, uh, the last uh, four years. Before that, I had done close to 25, 30,000 in Detroit and Philadelphia. Now, you briefly went into it, but can you explain a little bit more for the jury about the purpose, obviously, for an autopsy? Uh, the purpose of an autopsy is to determine the cause of death uh, of the individual and the manner of death has to be filled out on the death area. Uh, as in this case, the cause of death may be obvious because it's been shot multiple times, uh, but we have to retrieve evidence uh, from the body in that in this case, bullets. There's any trace evidence on the hands that starts at the scene and continues uh, when we do the autopsy. Uh, and we do specimens for uh, toxicology as well. Uh, but in this case, we were dealing with a 24 year old healthy young man, and his cause of death is manifestly obvious. Bunch of bullet holes in it, and the real purpose of the procedure was to determine exactly what damage they had done to him and to retreat the reports that were still in there. Let's take a step back. Just if you had spoke to the autopsy safe in Burlington County, but uh, in addition to your appointment here, do you hold um, any other appointment as a medical examiner in Russ? I cover other counties, we all do cover each other in uh, Burlington because most of the counties have only one or two. Medical examiners, so if one of them is not available, then the next whole county is in for example. So I cover for Ocean County uh, from time to time, and I, until recently, was covering the lower three counties for state medical examiner. Uh, I have just recently stopped doing that because it's too far to go. And that's Cape May, Cumberland, and Atlantic counties. And prior to beginning your appointment in Burlington uh, County, were you employed with the Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office? I was, I was the deputy chief there. In fact, my old deputy in Detroit had become the chief for I had moved out to California and he asked me if I'd come back and be deputy for And I was perfectly happy to do that. And unfortunately, he came down with Parkinson's disease. So for the last several years, uh, he couldn't function very well. In fact, he had retired and I was the acting chief for the last three or four years that I was there. Overall, how long were you there? Were you there? 19 years. Uh, prior to Philadelphia, were you employed anywhere else? I spent uh, about 18 months in California doing forensic pathology and hospital pathology, uh, part of a group of 14 pathologists. And one of their founding members was actually the technical consultant for the old Quincy series, if any of you are old enough to remember that. And uh, it was Mr. Lewis. Unfortunately, he then got my phone on the side, so I was taken on to a person. Uh, and I did both hospital pathology because they looked after at some point, uh, about nine hospitals. Uh, one of the reasons why I was glad to leave there, I was driving between Ventura County, Los Angeles County, and Orange County, going to various hospitals. For those of you who tried driving in LA, that's a strain. Prior to that, you had mentioned uh, working in Detroit as well? Yes. And how long were you there, and what were your duties there? I was uh, a fellow there for uh, one year, and then I was assistant medical examiner. Uh, approximately how many autopsies would you say you performed while you were in Wayne County in Detroit? Yeah. Probably, uh, again, I was only there for four, four years, but it would, again, be two or three thousand autopsies at least. Now, Doctor, over your 30 plus years that you've been employed as a medical examiner overall, uh, could you approximate or estimate the overall number of autopsies that you performed? I've probably performed myself personally in excess of 30,000 autopsies. Uh, at one point when I was in Philadelphia, I was covering Camden and all three surrounding counties as well. And I was doing way more autopsies than this person did probably around 1,500 a year. Uh, I was supposed to do really more, about 400. So uh, I've done a large number of autopsies because of that. And I was also in Philadelphia and in Wayne County before that. I was running the 
training program for other fellows. So uh, they would do autopsies that I would supervise. And often I would have to go and testify to me instead because they didn't move on by the time the case came to trial. So that would be at least double that number of autopsies that I was intimately involved in and often had to testify. Now, out of all those Forms. Uh, have any involved gunshot wounds? Uh, very many, especially when I was in Detroit and Philadelphia, we were doing several hundred homicides a year, 80% of the worldwide gun crime. Uh, during your career in the Center, have you been called to testify as an expert witness previously? Yes. Approximately how many occasions? Uh, thousands, and every homicide case we want to always meet to both the preliminary hearing sometimes and in the actual trial. So two or three times a week, I would testify when I was in Detroit and in Philadelphia. Uh, any other courts besides Detroit and Philadelphia? I've testified in, obviously, all the courts here in uh, Burlington County, but I've also testified in Sparrow County, Burlington County, and Sparrow County, Sparrow County, Sparrow County, Sparrow County, Sparrow County. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, I've testified in all the counties in southeastern Pennsylvania. And in what field of expertise? Almost always forensic of pathology, occasionally toxicology. Now it's time to stay with uh, Dr. Hood. Dr. Hood is a current field of forensic pathology. Mr. O'Reilly, you want to hear this time? Uh, most of, I have also no objection. Good morning, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. The court accepts uh, Dr. Hood as an expert in the field of forensic pathology based on his education and training and experience in being an expert in that area. Thank you. Uh, now, Doctor, in your capacity as the Chief Medical Examiner in Burlington County, did you perform an autopsy on the body of Shaquille Williams? I did. And where was that autopsy performed at? That was performed at the medical examiner's office here in Burlington County, mm -hmm. part of the county complex where you see the big antenna sticking up from on the road. Uh, and uh, that was done on uh, March 22nd. Uh, the young man to be pronounced dead late in the evening. First, my office went out to the scene and removed the body from the Now, can you just uh, briefly describe the basics of an autopsy procedure, just more than what you had done, right? Uh, basically, we start with whatever we find out that is known about the case. Either the young man had been identified and we had ID on and that was the so I can on scene. So, we knew who he was. I knew that uh, he'd been seated in a car and had been shot by uh, probably more than one individual. There was certainly more than one individual involved uh, about who was doing the shooting. But nine of there was two shooters, three shooters, or one shooter with more than one gun. That had been determined at that point. Uh, and he had been shot while seated in the car, and his body was in fact found. Having been seated in the driver's seat, slumped over back into the passenger side, and he had multiple wounds that had obviously come through the right foot partly open the driver's side of the or all the way to this side of his body. Uh, and that's all I knew uh, when I got him. The uh, body was processed as much as possible. It seemed critical body being pulled from there, uh, transported from there down to the medical examiner's office the next morning. Uh, the autopsy, which you can now see on television, you can basically uh, examine the body just as you see, and carefully take any evidence we can see off of it. Including the clothing, and in fact, uh, there were two bullets found in the west sleeve of the seat jacket that were removed at the scene before we went into the body bag as well. Uh, and then, uh, having examined the body, clothed, unclothed, cleaned it up, got all the trace evidence, if there is any of it, uh, we then performed an autopsy. As I say, you can see that on television now with a little white shaped incision of thorax and abdomen, and either ear incision and removal of the skull cap to the brain. Uh, and uh, that was done in this case, and the bullet paths were uh, determined, and then the bullets had stayed in the body they were retrieved. So, you, see, you start with what's called an external examination, is that right? Correct. You have to identify the wounds on the body, try and determine which ones are entrances, which ones are exits. Usually, not that difficult to do. And in this case, you did observe uh, signs of injury to Shaquille Williams? Yes, he was a shaver, so previously healthy 24 year old young man who was about 5'11, 180 pounds, and uh, he's clad in a jacket t shirt. He saw that was partly cut off of the And he clearly has sustained uh, multiple gunshot wounds. We started from the top to the bottom, there was one in the 
Chief, that was close range. The only one that was. It had some stippling around it, about two inches of stippling. The gun was probably only a few inches away when that one was caused. And then you had four that spread down the left upper arm, one that went right in the outside of the left elbow, the other four that went down the dorsal surface of the left forearm. They were all going from left to right. And two of them went through his left upper arm, bringing to his chest. Two of them went through his left forearm, bringing his flank. They were all going left to right, uh, upwards and backwards. And part of the difference in the pathways could be accounted for by the fact that as he was shot, he started to slump over, so the bullets are coming in at a different angle as he falls away from the guns that were being fired at. Do you document those injuries in your report? I did. And in addition to a report, uh, are they injuries also, are the observations photographed? They are. A lot of photographs taken as we did the whole process, both at the scene and once the bay was opened. All these photographs, just because it is, and it's unclothed and clean. Uh, and then all the wounds are documented. Uh, and uh, ultimately, the boss was taken out and photographed and documented as well. After you said, after conducting your external examination, Yes, having documented where they are on the outside of the body, we now open the body and then trace the parts of the bullets from the entrances to the exits or from the entrances to where they can at least be Okay, now breaking down the injuries that you observed that you stated, uh, you indicated that you observed the injuries specifically to his left cheek area, is that correct? Yes, just starting from the top and looking down. I had no idea what order they were inflicted in, but that's usually what we do is just immediately we start the top and work our way down. So the highest one was the one in his cheek, and we applied the side of the cheek and had about a two inches of gunpowder stippling around it, and that bullet went through his maxillary sinus, which is the, basically the uh, big lump of bones that he had done the uh, It went through the back of his mouth. Now down below the jaw into the neck. It went through his right carotid artery uh, and actually lodged just under the skin over here, uh, over the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is the muscle that gives you the chicken neck on the chin up. And that could easily be seen, even at the scene, it was just bobbing around under the skin. So that will react to one of the first three in case it fell out and we didn't find it again. So, uh, we did get that ball out, and it was the first of the bullets retrieved that was, it's a relatively distinctive ball, it's not un uncommon. It's a hollow point with a blue uh, plastic ball stuck in the end of it to make it aerodynamic and travel better through the air. And that once it enters the body, that ball is pushed back and helps the ball to expand and stay in the target. And uh, that was, uh, a fairly distinctive bullet that was retrieved first from uh, under the skin of the knee. That had caused a lot of bleeding, both out to the exterior and, of course, it made a connection between the carotid artery and the back of his throat. So a lot of blood went from there back into the back of his mouth and then got swallowed and aspirated into his lungs. Now, Doctor, you had stated uh, a moment ago the two-inch zone of stippling. Can you just briefly explain uh, what that is and what that means in this case? When a bullet is fired out of a gun, it happens because a uh, primer has been struck by the firing and can cause gunpowder to be behind the bullet to burn and create an explosive with a lot of very hot expanding gas that pushes the bullet down the barrel. That gunpowder is uh, divided up into tiny little uh, either balls, granules, discs, uh, you look at them under the hand when you say they have different shapes. And they don't always burn completely on the way down. Smokeless gunpowder is supposed to be just that. Smokeless and burn completely, but it doesn't quite. Uh, as a result, some of those particles of gunpowder either unburned or partly burned continue out of the end of the barrel behind the ball. But they're very light and they uh, fall away or drift away in the air quite quickly. So by the time you get out to around two feet with most standard emissions, there's not enough gunpowder still moving to be able to actually compete on the target. The closer you get, the more that gunpowder stick on the air will be, and the closer it will be towards the center of the, uh, the bullet path. 
So in this case, it was about a two-inch zone, round zone, and that was different. And that usually would mean that the hand was only a few inches away. But the time it gets out to two feet, there'll be only a few particles, and it'll be much more widely distributed. So was it your opinion that that was very close? Uh, very close, I mean, a couple of inches. It's not contact. There's no contact between the end of the bell and the end and the cheek. Uh, so it would probably be anywhere from two to six inches. Now, during the course of the examination, you would talk about being able to track that projectile. Yes. What was the track again? It went, instead of him standing up, like the soldier they teach before that man upon the position, it would be described as going from left to right, uh, downward, and backward. Uh, and it ended up down here. So that's the problem. Now, does the track itself indicate anything uh, potential about the position of the shooter? Well, it had to know the position of shooter and victim in their frame of reference, uh, which I don't always know. But here, we were a little more fortunate. We did know that he's seated in a car, and the bullets striking his left arm are entirely consistent with that. Uh, so the shooter is likely standing and therefore shooting someone down to the and that would match this particular bullet. Now, you had stated uh, previously about the injuries that had been caused, uh, specifically about getting the chronic artery. Would that shot in and of itself have been fatal in this case? To most lay people, it probably would be, because you'd have to think very fast and literally stick your thumb on a hole and close down the carotid artery. If somebody knew a bit about first aid was on scene and did that, then he could have survived that wound. He's a young man, he doesn't need that carotid artery to supply enough blood to the brain. He's got three others, the left carotid and two vertebrals, and it will do a good enough job of that. So he won't suffer any ill effects by having uh, he lost the blood flow from the right carotid artery. But of course, he'll bleed out from it very quickly if somebody doesn't put their thumb on the hole and stop it. Doctor, I'm going to show you regarding evidence as S14 in this case. It's going to appear on the screen. Can you, uh, Doctor, I think you have a pointer up there to it. Are you able to come down and join me here and just kind of, as I put the pictures up, uh, Point to the area of the stippling and what you notice. Uh, he's still very bloody, and you can see he's lying on pavement there. He's actually about to be taken. This is the, the body bag right here, the blue plastic. And he's about to be placed in that. This is after he's been removed from the car. Uh, so it's still on the bloody. You can see that they pronounced him by the uh, uh, heat pad. And Quite common here, and you can see, and here's the hole where it went in right there. So it's basically gone down to there. I'm going to show you what's in evidence as SE. Uh, can you again speak to this specific gunshot wound that we're speaking about at the moment in the cheek, and again, uh, anything that you noticed when looking at the victim himself? The point is not going to work on this. So I'm just watching you. Here's our. Somewhat irregular entrance wound there, uh, and the little double card stipples uh, distributed around it. So it's about a two inch um, And that's the uh, hole in his left cheek, and you already saw uh, the ball sticking out from under the skin down here. So you can figure out from that the path that it took. And uh, like I say it went through his right collar the artery, so going to be uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, somebody like to step in and put the thumb on the hole. And what this also shows is uh, the fact that being shot predominantly from the left side with this being up and following on the wheel or this line on the side of the uh, You can see the number of bullets scattered on the left side of his arm. There's one here, uh, there's two, yeah, and I've got the same distance with the top of the shoulder here. And then there's one down here. And then he also has one uh, on the lateral aspect of the left elbow. Uh, and then four more down dorsal left forearm, two of which are very close together. You'll see that possibly being demonstrated. Uh, I'm going to show you what's in evidence that that's not even. You stated that the bullet ended up, and you pointed out in the other picture, in his neck. Yes. And can you just look for this, uh, for this picture? Can you point out again where that was? There it is here. And it's actually, it's made a tiny little abrasion on the skin, where it's actually pushed the skin out against 
hoodie that we're wearing. Uh, he is the angel who's walking there. Um, now, do they depict all of these pictures? Do they depict the injuries as uh, you saw them to be on Shakir Williams that day? Yes. Uh, now, were you able to also see the bullet was removed from his neck? Is that right? This bullet was removed from his knee uh, because it was so prominent. And uh, the two proved to be that distinctive hollow point ball, a little void ball, uh, blue plastic ball on the end, uh, which is a, a well known ammunition and uh, quite a distinctive. Right. I'm going to show you what's in evidence that was 107. Specifically, is that what you're... Uh, yes, you have in this piece? It's come apart, but that is what it is. Here's the two pieces of blue plastic. Here's the jacket, and here's the cord. And after that's removed, uh, is it then turned over to the prosecutor's office? It is. Now, Doctor, you had... Uh, let me take your seat for a moment. Thank you. You had also indicated that there was... Uh, the four gunshot wounds uh, to the left upper arm of Mr. Williams, is that right? Correct. Can you describe the, natures of the, the nature of those injuries? Um, well, you saw the pictures of them. There's no close range associated with any of those. It was wearing clothing over that as well. So if they were, it would be on the, the sleeve of the clothing. Uh, the uppermost one uh, went through the, uh, the proximal left upper arm. It smashed his uh, bone, uh, the humerus. Uh, and came to rest just under the inner aspect of the skin of the upper arm. I'm going to go back on screen with some evidence as I say in that, and just to go with that. Uh, again, the four that we're speaking to at this moment, could you point them out here? Uh, okay, here we go. The proximal one, this is the one that smashed his uh, upper arm bone, and actually came to rest under the skin just below the armpit here. These two parallel one another, and they actually parallel one another right through his arm, right through his chest, and actually came forward very similar paths, and came out somewhere over here in the right armpit area. Uh, and then slightly lower down one is this one, which went down across the front of his left elbow, uh, and there was another one on the back of the elbow that did the same thing. Uh, and they actually made two sort of half to three quarter inch exit wounds that tore into one another. So we ended up with a big wound about one and a quarter inches uh, across from which two bullets had exited. And they may have been one of the two bullets that was found in his sleep uh, when he was uh, probably out of the car. Now, Doctor, the four that we're looking at right there, are they all entrance wounds or are they exit wounds? Those are all entrance wounds. They're nice and round and surface wounds, as opposed to big and ragged uh, with edges that you put back together, which is quite exit wounds. I'm going to show you, again, what's in evidence is S91. Uh, now, the bullet wound there on the top of his arm that we're looking at, is that an entrance wound or is that an exit wound? That's actually a hole made by me. I could feel that bullet. Uh, so I just simply, that's my scalpel wound that I made to go down to the bullet to show it nestled uh, in the, uh, just, just here, basically. It's nestled in the skin and muscle uh, after it had fractured the humerus. It came to rest there. Now, were you able to, or able to ultimately track the path of the four bullets from the upper arm as well? I was. And uh, what was that? The two bullets that were uh, the same distance below the top of the shoulder, <laughs> to the middle of the left upper arm, they came out on the inner aspect and re entered the chest, sort of slightly to the back, uh, but basically on the left side of the chest, down to the bottom of the rib cage. And the other one, as I say, that went in lower down came across the front of the elbow, uh, you might be missing any arteries in there, and it coincided, coincided with one that was in the back, outside aspect of the elbow itself. And the two of them followed a similar path. The exits were probably a half an inch apart, and because of that, they tore together and made one big uh, exit point. In fact, two of the four that went through the left forearm did the same thing, lower down here on the inner aspect of the left forearm. Came out close together and tore a hole uh, the joint. Yeah. What's uh, been marked for identification as S139? Uh, can you just speak to that picture? This is a picture of the left side of the chest and left flank uh, of Shaquille Williams, and it shows uh, one of the board re entrance wounds that went through his left upper arm and into the left side of his chest, and two more re entrance wounds that went.
coming through his forearm and came in down here in the left flank. And just above them are some irregular abrasions that were probably made by bullets that had gone through his upper arm or forearm, hit his body, but not with enough strength for it to be able to enter it. So his abrasion skin fell off and were probably recovered from either his sleeve or the counter. Doctor, is this an accident of uh, how he appeared that day? It is. Uh, I'm going to see what it has to mean in S3139 and fellowship. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Doctor, the wounds that we spoke about in the upper arm, again, can you point to uh, where they were exited and uh, the re-entrance wounds that you just spoke about? Well, this is really taking the show the uh, re-entrance wounds of his left side. Uh, the not really an exit wound, that's where uh, I actually ended up cutting and taking out that but you can see now how badly fractured his left humerus is. You're not supposed to have a joint there in the proximal upper arm. And what we're showing here is an irregular, broadly abraded re entrance wound of the bullet that had come out of the arm and gone back in there. And then from the forearm, uh, two bullets had ex exited the forearm, re entered his flank over here. And then here are the little irregular abrasions that are probably made by bullets that exited forearm that no longer had enough velocity to be able to re-enter his body. They just simply struck it and abraded it and were recovered from either the car or his clothing. Now again, speaking to, you spoke a minute about the bullet that you removed from his upper arm, um, showing what's been marked as, or is an evidence. Is that an accurate uh, depiction of the bullet that you were able to remove? There from his upper arm? Yes, it's actually uh, sticking out uh, from the uh, an attempt at exit point of his upper arm, quite immediately. And uh, you had stated you had to cut that one out, is that right? I did. To finish the job, I had to, uh, to cut it out. I'm going to show you what's in evidence is S92 on the screen. Uh, Again, speaking to that bullet wound in the upper left arm, is that one of the bullets that you had to cut out? It is. And again, what um, specifically to that bullet, if you can say, what injuries did that bullet to the upper arm cause? Uh, well, it shattered the proximal humerus and long bone of the upper arm. It also shattered itself in the process, as you can see, it was basically badly torn up. I did not find uh, a little blue plastic wad, but the bullet is so distorted that I can't say that it wasn't with somewhere in here. Which is not really a repeat, so you can't find it in uh, All I can say is it's medium sized, it's base jacket, and it's either was a hollow point or not, I can't tell. Now, moving on to the, you had spoken a moment ago about the left elbow, the gun shot one's left elbow, I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as S141. Uh, can you just tell me what you're looking at in that? This is showing both uh, an entrance wound in the lateral left elbow and the other four gunshot wounds that went in the, uh, the left forearm, two of which were basically kissing wounds. They were within a half an inch of each other, and they followed an identical path uh, through the arm and back into the and through the body. Is this an accurate depiction of how it appeared that day when you did the autopsy? It is. And you had talked about the two bullet wounds that almost joined together. Can you just point out the jury? Yes, yeah, yeah. We sometimes refer to those as kissing wounds because they prefer to up against each other. Here's the one uh, in the uh, that's further up. And is the one that's further down. Uh, but again, we have four bullet holes going into his left forearm. And one of those did actually fracture this one, the ulnar bone. Two of them did. The fracture is both up here and further down. Again, still speaking to the victim's left arm, I'm not going to show you S119 and S115 for identification. Are they pictures that are accurate or accurately represent? Uh, again, during the autopsy that you performed? Yes. Okay. Uh, at this time, state rest with 119 and 
the upper arm and the elbow uh, specifically. Um, can you speak a little bit about the re-entrance wounds that we can see uh, on the chest in this photo? Zone one, and that's the one down. Questions two. This one and that one. I'm bloody, unfortunately. These are more ragged and irregular than the than the wounds are larger uh, because the board is now distorted and going through the tunnel. And it makes them more rough. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, doctor. I just didn't hear that noise. Oh. They are larger than the real entrance wounds, uh, and they have a more roughly a green edge. That the bullet that made them was distorted by having gone through the upper arm first. Now, following the track again, you were able to find some corresponding exit wounds, is that right? There were corresponding exit wounds on the inner aspect of the left upper arm that matched these green entrance wounds uh, that you see down there. Now, I'm showing you S115, looking at this to the top of the photo specifically. Uh, are those some of the wounds that you were just speaking about? These are exit wounds uh, in the area of the elbow, and then you can see the bigger one up here that we just get the edge of. Two more, and then these are actually two wounds uh, that came out together. If you remember those two kissing wounds, they actually followed a very small part, half an inch apart, and came out through this big wound. And as you can see, the little blue plastic wall on one of the hollow points uh, got left behind. That's not uncommon. That's what it's designed to do is to come out, expand the board, and then pop out. And can you just again explain the nature of the damage that was caused by the projectile? Uh, once it went through his forearm, uh, one of them fractured the, the ulnar bones, bone on the outside, little finger side of the forearm, uh, towards the elbow, and again it fractured it about halfway down. Uh, so two bullets fractured the, the, uh, the left ulna, uh, and they made these. Uh, combined double exit wound and then two more exit wounds from the other two that went through more proximal. We were, we were talking a moment about the dorsal left forearm now, but just to kind of go over that again and move back down, uh, S141 is on the screen now. Again, the four gunshot wounds specifically to the lower portion of the arm? Yes. There's one, there's the two close together, and then another one further down, about midway down this forearm. And uh, were they covered in the, the damage that you just explained to the jury with the bullets had caused? Is that, are they contained within what you just explained? Yes, or I just described uh, all four of them went across the forearm. Two of them fractured the ulna bone in the process. They came out of basically uh, three exit wounds, uh, of which one was a large ragged one we just saw, but it was two combined. And those two that came out of that large ragged wound uh, actually re-entered again only an inch apart over his left flank. We've already seen that picture. Uh, and by then he was slumping over. So the bullet appears to go through his body quite sharply upwards because they were recovered from the area uh, of the, the right second rib on the front, just under his collarbone and the back of the right shoulder. So uh, they look like they're going more upward than you would expect. That's because his body is slumped over and is almost at right angles to the shooter shooting down at him. Within your report, you also mentioned a uh, gunshot wound to the left hand, is that right? That was the last of the wounds going from the top down his left arm. We had one in his left hand. Unfortunately, I screwed that up in my report and kept referring to it as the right. Uh, but it is the left hand, and it goes in the base of the left thumb, comes out the meaty part of the, called the phenar eminence, sort of, that forms the thumb side of the palm of the hand. Then it re the palm, and it finally went through the uh, the joint where your middle finger joins the end and came out the uh, top of the base of the left middle finger. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification of S116. Uh, is that specifically the injury to the hand that you were just speaking about? That is. We're actually looking at the, the exit and the re entry on this palm. Right? Okay. And it's an accurate depiction? It is. State what S116 published? Sure. No, okay. Uh, can you just point out for the, the jury, Dr. Hood, again, you were just saying it shows both the entrance and the exit. Can you specifically point to what you're speaking about? This is the re-entrance. It's come out of there, grazed and gone back in here, and then it actually, you can see that the ring finger uh, is actually fractured, so it's gone right through that, that knuckle joint here. And so you were able to track the bullet path in this case as well? Yes. Can you 
would show you what's been marked as S70 uh, for identification. Is that a better picture of the entrance wound? Uh, that's first the entry wound here. Uh, and here you can see the exit wound in that it has in fact fractured uh, the base of the French finger. Thank you, middle finger, I suppose. Make that clear. middle block ring, middle finger. I'm um, now showing you S87 that's in evidence again. Uh, now, this obviously was this picture taken before uh, the clothes and the jacket had been taken off of the victim? You're correct, and you can actually also see a little fragment of that fractured ulna bone is stuck in his sleeve, and a couple of bullets were stuck in that sleeve. Not surprising for the um, bullets that were going through that garment of the arm within it. Now, showing on the screen what's in evidence is S88. Uh, you had spoken about the finger itself in the track again. Yes. And so the, the bullet came out of basically his finger, is that right? The uh, dorsal base uh, of the left middle finger closer to the uh, middle finger side than the top side. Now, in your report, you also you spoke about the uh, back in this case. Did you observe an injury to the back? Yes, and that's just again starting at the top, going down to the bottom. The last one described is one that goes in the left back. Actually, went in basically a couple of inches below it, the bottom of his left shoulder blade. Uh, and that followed a path uh, that would be expected if that's probably the last bullet in the sequence when he's now lying down basically over towards the passenger side because that bullet ended up coming out of uh, the, the, uh, the front of where the shoulder joins his uh, chest. Okay, so I'm showing you what's been what's in evidence of S69. In this case, is that the uh, bullet wound to the back that you were just speaking of? Yes, there it is. And this is again, as you can see, lying on pavement. We're just getting a very rough assessment of what uh, injuries he has right there after he's been removed from the, uh, the car. Here's a, a cone that's often used to uh, mark fired cartridge cases all spent around, so that presumably there is one under that. Uh, and here is the bullet hole, as I said, it's just outside and below the bottom of his left shoulder blade. And that ended up being found out here on the front of the junction of his right uh, shoulder of his chest. I'm going to show you what's in evidence of S93 as well. Uh, was that a photograph that was taken actually during the course of the autopsy? It is. He's been a bit more cleaned up now, so you can see the entrance wound. It's got a scale next to it to give you an idea of the size. Now, what about that injury? Obviously, it looked you to conclude that it was, in fact, a gunshot. Well, I got a bullet out of the end of it, so that's always a very strong indicator. Uh, and you said you were able to follow the track of that bullet? Yes, uh, again, if you were to consider him standing upright uh, in the anatomical position, which he almost certainly was not in when he was shot, it would be described as going upward, forward, and rightward. And as I say, it ended up uh, uh, somewhere around the, just in front of the second rib on the right at the very top of his chest, over towards where it becomes his shoulder. And uh, see, so I've got. This pectoralis muscle uh, was the uh, where that bullet ended up, just in front of the right second rib, and that was a very different. Uh, uh, it was it was uh, a same kind of bullet as we got from some of those other wounds, which was a hollow point with a blue plastic wad in it. Some of the other bullets that were taken out from around here that came from the entrances of his upper arm <coughs> and from his shoulder flank uh, were not. They were different. They were base jacketed, but they weren't hollow points. Now, you had stated that there was internal damage. Can you state specifically what the internal damage or structures that were affected by this specific hole from the word? The one that went in his back went through uh, his left lung, his aorta. So again, that's a rapidly fatal wound. It's even worse than having one go through the right quarter artery. It went through his esophagus uh, and the right lung, and that's when it came out. It went through the right second and it stopped in his right neck, the right lung muscle. So both lungs, the esophagus and the aorta, were all struck by this bullet. So that too would be a rapidly fatal wound. <coughs> and you said you did locate this projectile in this case? I did. And again, it was one of the more typical ones with a hollow point and a blue plastic wad, uh, uh, or ball, in the end of a hollow point. Okay. Now, let's go back to the uh, range 
this wound is specifically from the arm through the body now. In your report, Doctor, did you mention uh, that there were in fact three entrance wounds from the left upper arm? <coughs> yes, and we've seen those in several of the images we've already looked at where the arm was out of the way. You could see the two of them re-entered in his chest and they came through the upper arm. And those are two that were close together. Well, at least they were a couple of inches apart, but they were at the same distance below the level of the shoulder. They came out the inner aspect of his left upper arm, re his left chest, and <coughs> went in somewhere towards the, uh, the lower aspect of the left side of his chest, more towards the back and the front. Uh, and uh, now, once they both of them here, I see in that picture. Once they re-entered his chest, uh, what if any uh, damage or structures did they? Back. Again, they followed similar paths, left to right, upward and backward, uh, and uh, they variously went through uh, everything they needed to to kill them, unfortunately. Uh, one of them went through the main pulmonary artery, they both went through uh, the left rib cage, the left lung, the right lung, uh, and came out of the area of the armpit. One of them actually came right out of the inside aspect of the armpit and went back in the, the outer aspect of it on your arm side and stopped right there under the skin. <coughs> and another one went further back and went as a little higher. It actually never actually made a re-entrance or an exit in the entrance. It stayed on top of the armpit and was pulled out of the armpit uh, towards the back. Uh, and both of those bullets were hollow points, were non-hollow points. They were reasonably large, medium-sized, fully encapsulated bullets, meaning that there's not just a jacket around the, the base uh, and, and the, the nose left exposed, but the whole thing was covered as a non hollow point bullet. So those are two very different bullets and the blue plastic water points of the politics. Now, speaking of that, you had said that one of those bullets actually came out, uh, you were able to find it in the right armpit? one that just went across the very apex of his arm. So it came out here, went in here, you can actually see the base of it sticking out of the hole because it almost didn't make it. So, uh, I'm just going to show you on the screen some evidence of S101. Uh, this is the actual bullet that came out of the arm. It's just a closer view of that specific injury. Yes, the bullet's been pulled out and you can see now that it's a very different bullet uh, than the other one. It's fully encapsulated. Uh, with a jacket that wraps all the way around there, you put it on in two pieces, um, and uh, it's not hollow point, it's still around no quite long. There's another one that looked like that, but it was short. So there were three different types of rounds that I could identify, the dollar station may very well identify even more. Um, now, after the bullets were recovered, they were turned over to the prosecutor's office as well? They were. Moving on to the other two uh, re entrance wounds or entrance wounds in the, I believe you referred to as the <coughs> flank area, is that right? Correct. These are ones that came through his left forearm. Uh, and they were the, the two kissing wounds, uh, almost certainly were responsible for those two adjacent re entrance wounds in his left flank. Uh, as we saw before, there they are. You see one of them a bit more irregular than the other, more irregular, irregular than the other. And that just happens to be because that particular bullet was probably more distorted uh, as it went through the left forearm and therefore made a bigger hole uh, when it re entered. Here's one of the re entrances from the upper arm. And here are the little abrasions made almost certainly by bullets that made it through the left forearm but could not then have enough, didn't have enough power left to go through uh, the, the body. These are probably bullets that did not strike. The, or that did strike the left ulna bone and fractured it, so they lost most of the energy there. Whereas these two missed the, uh, the bones of the forearm, so they still had enough energy left to penetrate quite long, a long way into his body. <coughs> Speaking to those two specifically, uh, as noted in your report, can you speak to what track they followed and what, if any, structures or organs that were damaged because uh, of them? Again, by the time he's struck by those, he's probably already well on his way down to or already lying on the uh, passenger side. Uh, and so the bullets appear to go quite sharply upward uh, in the same uh, path as all the others, upward, left to right and backward, uh, up through uh, the uh, left upper abdominal structures, you've got the stomach, uh, to the left lobe of the liver, they're both struck by those. 
and they pierced the diaphragm, they went through a little piece of the left lung, right through his heart, both of them, uh, through the uh, top of the right lung, and then into the area of the right shoulder. And, uh, and from there, I got a, remember I remember, I showed you a fully encapsulated bullet, but it was relatively long. But another bullet just like that, but shorter, uh, and that came uh, out of the, uh, the area of the right second rib again in, in here, uh, in front of the right shoulder. And that was, uh, uh, one of them was that short uh, bullet, uh, the base jacket, a hollow point with no plastic wad. Uh, and then the other one came out of the back of the right shoulder. And that was uh, a heavily nose jacket, a medium sized bullet with an exposed lead base, so it's, it's nose jacketed, it's not base jacketed. So again, it's a different looking round. So this gentleman has been struck by three or four different types of rounds. A ballistician can better testify as to uh, whether they were the same caliber, fired from the same weapon or not. Now, looking just to the bottom two wounds that we're talking about this moment, based on the structures that you mean that they damaged, would they in and of itself have been fatal? Because both of them went through the heart, yes. Um, and you spoke to a moment ago where one of those bullets came to rest in the uh, the right shoulder area, is that right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's in evidence, because that's 97. And is that what you were speaking of a moment ago? Yes, it's kind of hard to orient. He's lying on his left side. This is his, left, his right shoulder and his right upper arm. And I had to put that cut in there to expose the bullet that I'm showing you there, which is uh, the main jacket of bullet. And, uh, and I'm trying to remember that that one was the bullet or not. I'm pretty sure it wasn't. That's, that's the one that doesn't have a hollow point, but it has an exposed lead base. That's where the, uh, they actually make the, the, uh, the jacket first and they pour the lead into it. So the base is uh, exposed. So it's not a fully encapsulated kind. This is yet again a different kind of ammunition. Uh, but it could still be the same caliber and fired on the same weapon, but it's a different kind of ammunition. Again, speaking to the damage that that was uh, you stated both of them in the heart, so that bullet was hit. That's the bullet that went through his heart. His um, heart and basically, his heart was pretty much shredded by a bullet. Basically. And again, once these bullets were recovered, were they turned over to the prosecutor's office? They were. Um, now, Dr. Kuhnhouse, thank you. Based on your training experience in forensic pathology and your examination of Shaquille Williams in this case, were you able to reach any conclusions regarding the cause of death of Mr. Williams? As I said, uh, other than the tremendous amount of damage done by all the bullets, he appears to have previously been a 94 year old male with no other underlying conditions. And his cause of death was manifestly due only to multiple gunshot wounds, which is why he paid as his cause of death on his report and his death still there. Now, do you hold those conclusions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? I do. And uh, were you able to ultimately come to any conclusions with regard to the manner of the victim's death in this case? Uh, well, the manner of death is a box that I have to fill in, whether I like it or not, on the death certificate. I get a choice of natural suicide, accident, homicide. Mm -hmm. Uh, or uh, unable to be determined, and sometimes you use that skeleton of remains, for instance. Uh, in this case, I made him in a homicide because he clearly had been killed as a result of the, the actions of other people. And do you ultimately hold that as well to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? I do. Thank you, Your Honor. Good question. Mr. Riley? Yes, sir. Good morning, Dr. How are you? Good morning. A couple quick questions, please. When we went to the examination of this young man, did you see any prior injuries, any wounding or prior shooting artifacts when you examined it? Objection, Your Honor. Problems. He had some scars on a typical 24 year old. Nothing that specifically I could say was caused by a prior stab wound or bullet wound, but then they don't leave very specific scars either. So the best I can say is I did not on X-ray find any extra bullets, old bullets in him, uh, but I did see some extra scars. Uh, in fact, you saw someone just looking at them coincidentally in pictures of them. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Now, you would agree with me on, I would think, that there's quite a number of tattoos on his upper body. Do you see those? Yes, indeed. Now, have you been trained to evaluate the significance of tattoos? Judge, I'm going to object again outside the scope and relevance. Well, um, let me have a brief side talk on it. I'll pop up.
Because that would actually not hit me right away as being none of the other tattoos were physical of the Latin kings, but I certainly could not exclude it. Okay. Now, with regard to that particular tattoo, you can't exclude that as a tattoo or a gang tattoo manifesting the Latin kings. Correct. Thank you. Ms. Hodgson, do you have any questions in this line of questioning? Uh, yes. So, Mr. Riley just said you can't exclude it, but you can't include it either. Correct. Okay. And uh, were his parents' names also, or were their names tattooed also within the crowns? There were names, and there was another uh, typical tattoo of an RIP and a winged uh, halo name. And have you ever been qualified as an expert with anything to do with gang tattoos? I have not. There are, as I say, people who are, have real expertise in that field, and not just the tattoos, but the graffiti as well. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'll excuse you at this time. Thank you. I want to have you just wait one of the ante rooms out there, and um, uh, we'll go from there. Um, okay, Mr. Riley, any additional arguments uh, with respect to the um, qualifications of this particular witness that testifies to the tattoo? No, sir, thank you. Just in the rule, too, I mean, it qualifies basically what the basis of knowledge is for an expert to testify. And they have to have specific knowledge, specific skill, experience, training, and or education to be able to testify. And aside from seeing them occasionally during autopsies, especially in New Jersey, the doctor testified that he has none. So the application um, or the objection, the proffer was that the defendant wanted to question Dr. Hood as to his knowledge of tattoos on the decedent's body um, and the problem was that they may be um, gang related or gang affiliated um, and that's certainly something that the defendant wanted to get into if the state was wanting to bring it up but this particular witness uh, the state has objected on a number of grounds we've had one of the hearing the court is um, going to sustain its objection to this line of questioning i do not find that dr hood uh, number one, has the education, experience, or training to testify as to the significance of the tattoos on the deceased's body. Uh, he candidly indicated that there are, there's an area of pathology or specialists in the field who do testify, testify as to gains and tattoos and the significance of the tattoos, but he is not one of those specialized uh, pathologists uh, in that area. Uh, he indicated he's not an expert in that area. Um, for, um, for New Jersey gang affiliation. He did testify that he was in Pennsylvania, that there were certain tattoos associated with certain gangs, but that he is not an expert in that area for the state of New Jersey, or has not been qualified as, as an expert in that area. Um, there was some testimony about a crown on the left side of the defendant's body being associated with uh, the Latin kings, but again, this witness was not able to um, confirm or deny. Um, that information as it relates to this decedent. So there would be no basis for the court in 702 to um, allow Dr. Hood to testify as an expert in this area or otherwise. So I will sustain the objection. All right. So with that, we'll, we'll take another uh, five minutes or so before we uh, get ready for the next witness. Who will be? Uh, Detective Sergeant Christopher Clayton from the state police. All right. And, um, you can excuse Dr. Hood for the day. We'll take another five minutes and we'll uh, bring the jury out and we'll keep going. Thank all right, you. thank you all.